really. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight um, for two reasons. First, because I haven't been in uh, Berlin for a while. Um, and second, because uh, I was an early investor in this uh, wonderful thing called the family. Um, and I'm amazed by how it's grown and, and the fact that there's this beautiful place now in Berlin. I remember uh, um, helping uh, with the moving in in Paris back then. Um, and, and, you know, I'm amazed with, with you know, the growth, etc. So you guys definitely want to check it out. Um, a couple of very, very smart people, probably some of the smartest in Europe, um, in what they do. Um, I, I'm, first, before I start, I'm going to give you a quick disclaimer. Um, I've, I've, I've actually slept two hours. Uh, I was in New York yesterday, uh, I flew to Paris, and then I flew to um, Paris to, to Berlin today. Um, so, so you're going to get a very jet-lagged version of, uh, of, of my pitch and my ideas about uh, uh, seed hardware fundraising. Um, so, but like, let's try to make it as, as interactive as we can. So I know that we have a Q&A in the end, but if you have any question before, feel free to jump in. Um, I'll try to do my best to, to, to reply. Um, okay, so let's jump. Uh, I have a few slides. I'm, I'm probably not going to go through all of them, or maybe I'm going to try. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Um, the, the one thing I want to say is that, yeah, that those slides were mostly assembled for previous conferences, etc. So I'm going to focus on one or two things. We, it's a we're going to talk about seed hardware fundraising, but it's a very, very general topic. We would, it would be you know, like if you want to learn more, there's tons of resources online. There's, there's actually accelerators that are doing three months program just for that. Um, so I, I don't pretend to give you all of the, you know, the resources you need for that. I'm just going to give you one or two things because we are actually a seed hardware fund and we're probably the only one in Europe um, investing only in hardware. So yeah, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. Uh, first, introducing myself. Um, my name is Alexi, um, and I'm the founder and president of, uh, of uh, this thing called Hardware Club uh, that we started a bit more than three years ago in Paris. Um, and so the whole idea uh, when we started Hardware Club is that we realized that there was a lot of founders in Europe that were trying to, um, and there was this new generation three or four years ago. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, maybe some of you in the room were starting companies, but like there was a lot of people trying to, 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 to build companies, and there was not that much resources for those people. Um, so we, um, me and my co-founder, had started a small um, angel fund uh, that would invest small checks in companies. Um, and we started investing a bit more in hardware. And we realized that hardware companies all had the same issues. How do I deal with China? How do I build a, a distribution network? How do I, um, how do I source this component? What do I do for, how do I prototype my product, et cetera? Um, and so we felt, okay, um, there's probably some people that know about this. The thing is VCs, you know, um, and we're gonna come back to that, but we're generally not so excited about hardware. It's changed a bit, um, but it's free. And we're, we're a small fund. We started three years ago, and re I realized last time working on slides for our investors that we had made more investments than any other um, in the space, and more investments in the hardware space than any other uh, investor in Europe, um, which was kind of a surprise for me. Um, so back then it was even worse, so very few VCs had invested in hardware, so they could, they could not really help companies with resources that they had for software companies. Um, and so the whole idea was, okay, how can we create a value-add investor? How can we add a, create a value-add resource platform that can help companies go from the first stages of the prototype to potentially scaling? Um, and so we figured out that the best way to do that was to actually find experts, um, companies, uh, founders, bring them together um, and, and, and look at the interactions that they would have and, and we would kind of naturally create an environment uh, where people could exchange ideas, tips about what to do in what situation. Having companies at different stages as well would help um, because some of the companies usually uh, are also sometimes trying to reinvent the wheel. So going to a later stage company would help with just being able to, to find a quick solution to a problem that could have taken way more time to solve. 
So that's what uh, we are today. So long story short, we started doing dinners. Um, I remember our first dinner was probably in Paris in, in May 2014. We gathered five or six entrepreneurs. We felt there was something that, you know, this model of bringing people together, um, bringing topics on the table and letting them talk about it would work. And so we felt, okay, let's, let's scale this up. So it was one dinner in Paris, one dinner in Berlin, one dinner in London, and then we did maybe five, 50 dinners and then we did bigger events. I remember doing a, one of my first meetups actually uh, at uh, Beta House maybe three years ago. We were discussing about that earlier. Um, maybe I'm going to go and talk about my slides afterwards because we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's probably 17 slides that I need to talk about afterwards. But, um, but long story short, um, we, we had the, this meetup and I remember like, it was the first time coming to Paris. I think Tobias was there. Um, and, and I think that was probably the first time we, we, we met in person. Um, and back then you had the first product or you were post Kickstarter, I don't remember, but you were talking about, we were, I think the whole event was about crowdfunding in general. Anyway, um, so um, long story short, again, we're a community-based organization today, which means that we, we've grown our operation from a community, small community of founders that we would bring together to dinners to a large community online. Uh, we have a Slack group much like the family has, uh, but that only gathers hardware founders. We have a, com we have a platform online where companies can, can find resources on distribution, manufacturing, um, and we organize events. Um, so private events um, and public events. So now in terms of public events, we do one every year. This year is gonna be in San Francisco in October. It's, it's gonna be called Atoms. We expect about 1,000 people. Um, and last year we did one in Paris. Um, and, but we organize a lot of events for our community in general, just, uh, just so they, they come together. We had a dinner with some of the guys that are actually here tonight um, last month uh, at a good restaurant. Um, so um, I told you about the community side of, of, of Hardware Club. So right now we have 400 companies in the club, uh, which is, we start in Europe, but unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, now the community is mostly US because we opened an office in San Francisco about two and a half years ago. Um, and we have a small team now in the Bay Area. So 200 of our companies roughly are from the US. We have 160 or 70 that are from Europe. Um, Paris, Berlin, and London are the big, 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 uh, big, uh, big places for us in Europe. Um, and and yeah, that, that kind of a community represents uh, a bit more than a thousand founders. On top of, of the community, we added a fund. So that's why we're, we're, we're talking about community-based uh, VC. It's basically having this two-layer process where we onboard companies in the community. After a while, it's totally free. Companies get joined. We only select about 5% of companies that apply. So it's, we're really, really selective. We're really trying to bring the, the best people in the hardware ecosystem inside the community and then we work with them, we provide them with resources, and at some point we would make an investment. Uh, so far we've made 17, I think we actually have made 18 investments. Uh, we, just, we just made one today in a company in London. Um, and we have a fund that's $30 million. So we write checks between $200,000 and $1.5 million. In Europe, we haven't invested in a company in Germany, but I want to fix that uh, as up. So. Uh, if you know any good, good companies or if you, have a, if you are a, a hardware founder and you're fundraising, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to come to us. Um, yeah, so we're going to try to talk about um, seed fundraising. I don't know how much time I have. Was there, there, was there a way to check that? Okay, you'll let me know or you'll make a sign if I... I, I don't want to spend, yeah, I don't want to talk for two hours. Okay, okay, you'll let me know. Um, yeah, so they... they I think this, this was a, a blog post that I really liked from Hento Woke um, a couple of months ago. He was saying something that I think we had kind of experienced for a while, which, which is especially true for hardware companies, which is that seed now has become this phase rather than this round. Uh, I think a few years ago, companies would go and say, oh, now I'm raising a seed, I'm raising a million, and then 18 months from now, I'm gonna be ready to raise an A. Um, my runway is going to be like that, 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 that. Our experience investing in hardware startups, and I'll give you a few examples afterwards, uh, has been quite different, actually. Um, we haven't seen many companies do that. We have seen companies raising pre-seed, pre-seed extension, seed round, seed round extension. Um, maybe, I don't know if, if, that, if that kind of uh, 
um, mirror some of your experience, but I think that's, that's something that we've seen a lot. Um, and so C has become this thing that's more like a face. Um, and so you get out of that phase when you get traction, which for a hardware startup can usually be a few years. It's not rare to see a com companies being in that phase for like three, four years until they're able to have a product to sell um, and, and, and see that traction going where VCs, more traditional VCs than us, get interested in the business that they've been able to create out of the product that they, they initially uh, prototyped. So that's kind of general example. I mean, I, I know more exceptions to this than, than, than companies that have actually followed ex this, this exact path, but that's just to show that basically there's a path going from pre-seed to seed to post-seed usually. Uh, we see some companies being able to raise an A right there. We see some companies being able, because the founders have, done, have had previous experience, being able to raise an A directly starting a company with like 15 or 20 million dollars, which you know, doesn't really necessarily go well as well because there's no such thing as an ersatz to testing your product market fit early when you're hardware startup. I'll come back to that. Um, again, very generic examples, but what does precede, where do you raise precede usually to prototype? You're starting, um, we invested in this company uh, that I'll come back, um, that I'll talk a bit about later, that's called Cowboy, that's building this e-bike, and, and we invested last year, they were really in this phase, they had, a, they, had, they had a few slides, they wanted to do something, but they had no prototype, so we really wanted, and that's really rare, usually we invest in working, in companies with working prototypes, so that was the first thing, the first time we, we, we actually did that so early. So pre-seed, let's say, is more like prototyping. Seed, um, you're gonna look at, depending on the size of the round, you're gonna look at being able to actually launch a product and then industrialize it. Um, I think there's some, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it, but I, I think that's a topic that I'm actually interested in now. It's like reinventing the playbook of hardware. Uh, we all know of that path that many companies took of you know, raising money on Kickstarter, ending up with 10 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 people waiting for a product and having this, this kind of massive pressure on your shoulders early and having to raise money on top of that because usually the, the money you raise on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or on pre-orders you took on your, web, on your website is not enough to, to, to fund the manufacturing. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely a new playbook to create here and I'll come back on some of those aspects and some of the advice I would have for companies today. Uh, and post-seed is, is the early phase of scaling. Obviously, you're probably going to need an A to go to a global scaling and end up at Best Buy if you're doing a consumer hardware startup. Um, but you're targeting this, or that's kind of the, 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 the light in the end of the tunnel. Uh, who to pitch, depending on the round. So I'm, I'm not inventing anything, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here. I think one of the things that's interesting, and, and I think that uh, uh, Tobias talked a bit about Way Combinator uh, earlier, uh, which is a great program, and, and I think they provide a lot of resources, so they're not hardware specific. Now they have, um, they have, they have, they have people that have good experience in hardware with Eric from Pebble, that's kind of leading their efforts there. Um, so one of the thing, one of the people to, some of the people to talk to at pre-seed stage, uh, obviously you want to start with your friends, with your family, with the people around you, with the angels that, that you know, some people usually that can bring value to you. So the, what I define as value for angels early is like people that can bring you other money. But, so either they, get, they have connections to funds or they have connections to other angels and can provide you uh, more money than, than just their check. Uh, accelerators, um, again, I think that's, some, that's a topic that um, if you guys are in hardware, you probably know already, but there's great accelerators like Axe um, or seed funds that are actually helping on manufacturing or prototyping like Bolt in the US, like Lemnos Labs, um, so hardware specific accelerators. There's more generalist accelerators like Way Combinator, like The Alchemist uh, in San Francisco, uh, like a few others, I'm trying to find a good German example. Um, <laughs> Hmm? You're breaking my hardware Am I? Yeah. Why is that? Oh yeah, hardware.co. Yeah, that's a great example. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my understanding of hardware.co was that it was more of a of a it was in between a, 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 a kind of boot camp and an accelerator, right? It would be rather short. Yeah. yeah. Three weeks, four weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, does that still exist? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. So you know, um, hardware.co in Germany. Um, and so, and I think there's a few others. There's one called Startup Bootcamp IoT now in London, etc. Uh, Seed, 
you saw, you know, seed funds, angels, micro VCs. Um, a micro VC is, a, is, is usually the way to say that is a smaller VC, usually a sub hundred million dollar fund. Um, I think one thing at seed, the, one of the piece of advice I give to a lot of founders when they get to that stage is like there's two ways to see, see this. Sometimes bigger funds uh, are also interested in putting smaller checks in companies, and that's what they call their seed strategy. Uh, one of the issues with that sometimes, I think there's two. There's one, they don't necessarily get a lot of the support from, 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 from that big fund that is actually investing a small, very small check compared to their average uh, check size. Uh, so that's something that could be um, kind of a double sword thing. Um, and the other thing is there's a signaling effect. So if you've got a big, big name like I don't know, let's say Climate Perkins or, um, or Anderson Orbitz or Sequoia investing at, see at seed stage in your company and then other funds, potential co-investors, are going to expect them to be part of, the, of your next round. And if they are not because they have seen you and they don't like your progress or they think you've taken too much time or by their standards you're not there yet, uh, then it sends a very bad signal that we, that's what we call the signaling risk. Um, so that's one thing where um, I think really at seed stage, um, my view of it is that like a seed stage investor is really different from a VC um, that invests in, in A and B rounds. Uh, it's a different job, it's a different relationship with founders, it's a potentially better alignment, um, but it's also a different way to work. Um, and, and so I think that for seed I would definitely advise and I'm also of course pitching my own uh, uh, venture here, but I think that, that makes sense to kind of uh, uh, go to seed funds uh, at this stage and angels that can bring value and micro VCs potentially. Um, post seed, um, VCs, seed funds, corporates, um, I'm probably going to move forward just so we have a bit more time for the interesting stuff in the end. Um, typical round, round size, again, um, I think those numbers are, I know tons and tons of, ex of exceptions to them, but let's say Building a prototype is probably going to cost you a few hundred thousand dollars. You want to make sure that you at least uh, raising the first round get that 20, that, that 20, that 12 to 15 to potentially 18 months runway just to be able to start and 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 be able to focus really on the product because that phase is really key. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to, you to I'll come back to that afterwards. Seed um, could be anywhere from 500k to 4 millions uh, in the end. We've seen depending on whether we're talking about Europe or US. Uh, round sizes and names vary a lot, um, but you know, it's basically financing um, your, your pre-scaling or the first part of your scaling pack, so you really want to make sure that you have enough cash. And post-seed could go anywhere from like two to four million to actually uh, 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 and, uh, what is, would be a smaller kind of A round would probably be five, five or six million. Um, yeah, so just wanted to kind of give you a few examples of this because it was a bit theoretical. So just a few examples of companies that we've invested in at different stages and what has been their equity story. So this one is called Print. Um, so they have this small, do, do you know, do you guys know, know it already? Yeah? Only one person out of a full room. Yeah, we haven't done a great job then. Um, so they, the French company, we met them really, really early. We invested a, uh, at a very early stage in 2014. Um, so they built this small uh, mobile um, printer, so it, it works like a case that is able to print instant pictures. And the pictures have an AR layer on it, um, on them, which basically enable you to see a small video uh, when you scan them with your phone. So there's a, there's a smart AR software play on top of the hardware that we really liked. There's also kind of this Nespresso model that I think we were talking about recurring revenue earlier on, so there's, they act, they're also selling paper because you need to buy the, 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 the device, but you also need paper afterwards to take pictures. Um, so it's a good kind of model because then it's true that help VCs in general like a model where it's not just pure hardware sales with that product cycle hype and, and, and the risk of, of not being able to create more revenue afterwards. Um, so we really liked the company. We met the founders really early. They were still students in a school in France called Polytechnique. Um, they, they, they were really early. They were really young. So we advised them to go to, a, to an accelerator program. They actually ended up going to Axe. We wrote a small check along with Angels and Axe back then, which was probably $300,000. Then they raised, um, they went to the US. They raised a, a, a larger seed round with binary capital. Uh, and Root Ventures um, that enabled them to launch um, a Kickstarter campaign. They launched a campaign that was, I think, 
that is probably still the, la the largest uh, Kickstarter campaign ever launched in France. I think they raised 1.6 million uh, dollars, um, which, which led to some issues as well because they ended up with a lot of people. They had not shipped one product, but there are a lot of people waiting for, I mean, tens of thousands of people waiting for a product that had never been built. So you can imagine the issues that come with that. Uh, and I think that's probably one thing in the, in the general playbook of hardware startups that we need to reinvent. And so um, they still shipped almost on time. I think they were three months late on Kickstarter, which is pretty good. Yeah, and they shipped the product. Um, and they ended up raising with GGV uh, uh, a round that was $7 million. Um, you guys afterwards, if you have questions about, you know, about this, I'm just putting this here as well so, so we can have kind of a few rep uh, reference points to discuss about. Uh, this company, really excited about it, um, it's called Rich Robotics, it's a company from Bristol, they're building this uh, small spider robot um, that is uh, actually, that has an AR, so augmented reality layer on top of it, so you basically, the way you use the product is you would typically use your phone as a remote control and on top of uh, the you know, you using the phone, you would have um, monsters coming, you would have different kind of, uh, the gameplay would be built in, in AR around the product. Um, again, we were one of the first investors, I think actually for this one we were the first investor. Um, then the company, the founders were quite early as well, so they went to the Qual Qualcomm Techstars Accelerator. That Accelerator is dead, so it's, um, it's you know, don't, don't try to apply. Um, so he, he, they had one batch actually, um, and so they went there. Uh, after after that, they, they raised that round from London-based investors, so London venture partners. That is a gaming fund and Patient Capital. Um, and later last year, they raised a seven million dollar um, A round. Um, really excited about that one, uh, Belgian company. Uh, they just launched yesterday. Uh, that was one of the companies I mentioned earlier. So we actually led their, pre their round last year, their pre-seed round, where they raised $800,000. So the founders were a bit more experienced than, than typically the founders you would find. Uh, they, had, they had launched another company in France called Take It Easy, uh, which was kind of a competitor to Deliveroo. Um, that company kind of crashed um, two years ago and they felt, okay, you know, what have we learned through our experience that, you know, mobi in the mobility space, we've learned that, um, well, in Paris and in most big, big cities, um, you know, mobility is not really well done yet. It's not really efficient. So there's no good solution, good e-bike on the market that is actually affordable, that, that does a, a, a good job at being smart, at, at uh, preventing uh, theft, um, and that is able to, um, to, to kind of uh, uh, create uh, something maybe cooler than the, the, some of the a cooler brand than some of the, 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 the bikes you would find on the market that are probably more targeted to a older audience. So the idea was to build a new brand uh, of smarter e-bike targeting urban riders um, in, in big cities. Um, and so it's called Cowboy. Oh yeah, yeah, you cannot see it. Yeah, it's called Cowboy. Uh, and so they just, they just launched actually a few, few days ago uh, in Belgium, uh, really excited about it. Uh, and, and so we raised the pre-seed round last year and they got some, some more money uh, through Index Ventures and Kima Ventures. I'll talk a bit about them again. Um, and again, you need to tell me how much time I have yeah, because... You, you're getting over there. So okay, okay, okay. So I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump to, to some of the, the things I, I wanted to say. So. Um, just a few notes, but that's kind of, I think, a lot of the founders I meet, and, um, and we, we do meet a lot of people because that's what we do as, a, as our job, <laughs> meeting founders that are trying to, seed the, to raise seed rounds. Um, they get, a, I think founders get a lot of pushback trying to raise seed, uh, seed rounds in for hardware companies uh, just because they're not software companies. So I think the, the, the most obvious advice I would give you whenever thinking about this is just really make sure you, tr you talk to the right people. Uh, Tobias said something really true which is that you, 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 know, you may look for VCs, but there are also other opportunities, and there's also other people like corporates that you could, you could pitch. Uh, people that are already in the industry that know hardware, that are not afraid about it, that, are, that, that, that know what the industry is about, so that's one thing you need to keep in mind. But uh, because a lot of VCs that you're gonna pitch or you're gonna try to pitch are only investing in software and they have software in mind, um, and quite often you're just wasting your time. They're gonna sometimes see you because you have a cool product, but they're never gonna invest in you and they're gonna give you advice that, that you know, 
is probably yeah, quite close to garbage sometimes, um, telling you, oh, you know, like uh, you should move faster or do things that you know don't necessarily make sense if you're a hardware company. Um, so the general perception is that hardware is more capital intensive, which is true for the early stage. Uh, I think we, we need to be clear about that, that you cannot, and a lot of VCs see that, that you, it's hard, and when I talk sometimes to co-investors, they're like, yeah, but we don't know about user data. Um, do you know if people are really going to use it on a daily basis? It's hard, have they, have they had products on the field? No, not really, so it's, it's something that, that kind of uh, push you know, it's, it's a big pushback for a lot of software uh, investors, while when they invest in software companies, companies that even have a prototype or an early version of the product can show that they have, they have you know, they have this many uh, users on a daily basis, they have this churn, they have these uh, metrics that they can, ab they're able to kind of showcase, and, and, and what software investors or especially people that are looking at a lot that SaaS companies would do is that they would rank that uh, to other companies that they see. Um, and so that's something that's, that's a bit harder to do for a hardware company, but I'll come back to some of the ways you can try to create that. Um, it's hard to find a product market fit early. Um, it would be a longer debate whether Kickstarter or Indiegogo or pre-orders uh, are product market fit. I was a big believer in it. I, I, I'm, I'm not so much anymore, um, just because I've seen the data and some of the best uh, Hardware successes we've had were not necessarily like huge uh, pre-order campaigns. If we think about Misfit, if we think about Peloton, if we think about a lot of those companies. So I'm thinking that there might actually be an inverse correlation sometimes. Um, so anyway, I think product market fit doesn't necessarily just mean pre-order on your website. It means, it means really knowing what your audience is and, and your audience probably goes beyond those early adopters that would just fund any project on Kickstarter. Um, Again, perception, manufacturing risk, defensibility, um, and obviously if you look at software companies, quite often the exact opposite, the lean approach that a lot of VCs like because it means that you know, it kind of a, you have a safer bet if you're able, if you invest in a company and there's ways they can iterate or pivot, then you, you haven't lost them, your money if, they, if you put family in the company, they launch a product and no one buys it, there's other ways, other ways you can do something. Um, if you invest in a hardware product, it might be slightly more complicated to rebuild an entire product if the first product doesn't work. So that's something that, that, that kind of scares a lot of uh, software in uh, investors. So that leads me to, to, to one or two pieces of advice I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would kind of give. Uh, the first one is, um, and again, I need to do make mea culpa there because like probably when we had that event a few <laughs> years ago, I would tell you like, you know, go big on Kickstarter, do a huge campaign, that's what matters, um, try to raise money on top of that. I, I don't believe in this anymore. Uh, I think that the, the best way to start um, is really to try to launch small and, and, and launch fast. And I think that, that probably echoes what, what Toby said earlier. Um, Big launch doesn't mean good launch, and again, if you, if you look at what Misfit, Peloton, all those companies did, they did small campaigns, I mean, not so small in the end, they were like a couple hundred thousand dollars um, crowdfunding campaigns, which is, which is definitely good, but they were not those huge campaigns that we've seen Pebble and, and Cooler Schooler and many other companies do. Um, and, and the reason for that is that what matters at seed stage is user data. It matters, I think it really matters more than pre-order numbers. So, um, and, and it's easier said than done, but the, the piece of advice I give to maybe 50% of the entrepreneurs I meet today is if you, are, if you are able to build a small version of your product or even a prototype and you can build 20 then, and just try to sell them or give them to someone and just see what they do with it and iterate on that and don't spend too much and not over designing something that you, you, which, you know, which value you don't really know. Um, and there's great examples of companies that have been complete failures trying to do that. Um, again, I will probably not have enough time to, to talk about them, but you know, like, it's, it's definitely the best way to go. So trying to go small, build first versions of the product, giving it to your users, trying to understand what they do with it, being really humble about, about how you're going to reiterate on it. The small things that you can do and that don't cost too much money, you want to do that. Um, and, and so I think that's one, one way to do that. And if you compare that with software companies, it's the same thing, right? If you launch an app tomorrow, you're not gonna go big and try to acquire as many users as you can first. The first thing you're gonna try to do is, is to check what are the, the metrics on your app. 
is to try to, to optimize your retention on the app, to, to make sure that people really use the app on a daily basis, and then you're going to spend money uh, trying to have people, uh, um, more people uh, in your user base. I think there's probably something similar to do with, 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 with uh, hardware companies, uh, trying to build product first, really understand what, the, what is the user value, what, is, what, is, what, what kind of data you can get, and how you can build on top of that. Um, second thing, uh, wow, that's a pretty low res uh, uh, <laughs> picture. Sorry about that. Um, the, the, the one of the things that, that, that I saw and that we see on a daily basis and, and we're, we're on the other side of the table, so we see that. Uh, having a great demo makes a difference. And that sounds like something that's obvious, but like most hardware companies don't really coordinate fundraising and demo timelines. They don't really work on, on, on creating, on saying, okay, I'm gonna pitch investors for this seed round. I'm gonna build an amazing product. And, and once I have this amazing product, then I'm gonna be able to show that it works. Because believe it or not, people are not gonna, just gonna believe your slides. They're gonna, if they see a product, if they can try it, if they can bring it home, if they can use it for a couple of days, that works. And a great example of that is the company I mentioned earlier, this one. Um, Cowboy bike. They were in the situation. We raised their, their pre-seed round last year, and we were discussing with the guys, and they were like, "Yeah, we, I, you know, I think what, for what we're doing, I think we're going to have a, tr a hard time raising the next round, just because you know we're a hardware company." You know, uh, what I've heard a lot, founders complain about, you know, how hard their their space was, and I told them, "No, you know, like, go ahead. Let's build an, a, a great prototype. Let's let's go as, as as far as we can in terms of building a product with the money we have, and 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 let's." bring the product to people. And they had an amazing conversion on, on, on just the, the, the trials they did when they, were, they would just bring a demo to a, a demo product to a VC, leave in the product for two or three days. That would be quite straightforward, right? The guy would use it and would really like it. And that was the case at Mar of Martin, uh, who was one of the partners at Index Ventures. He really liked it. He really saw how he could change his, his, uh, his daily routine. And, and he really then got the whole idea. It was much simpler than a, than a, than a 15 or 20 or 30, 30 uh, um, uh, slide deck. It was much, much more simpler. So, so I think that's one thing that uh, a lot of uh, uh, hardware uh, startups could do better uh, is really, really work on a demo. And we've seen extreme examples of that. Think about Magic Leap, right? Uh, those guys never shipped a product. And they raised billions of dollars. No, but, you know, that's... That's scary sometimes. That's true, but the same thing would, would for you don't you're probably not trying to raise a billion dollars as well, right? So if you're raising a million or two, having a great demo could do it, right? And and telling a good story about your team could 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 be compelling enough. Um, and so yeah, so I think that's something that hardware startups could do better in general. That sounds really general as an, as, an as a piece of advice, but I. I Trust me, on a daily basis, I see the difference when we invest in companies, when we see some of our portfolio companies raise follow-on funding. There's definitely this, and that's one of the biggest factors um, in, in terms of who is able to raise compared to who is not. Um, last one, I think, um, is, yeah, pitch a business, not a product. So we're talking a bit about that, um, how you want to build a business that is hardware enabled, not just a come with a hardware product. So when you look at the first generation that of hardware products that we've seen a few years back, there was a lot of companies that would come with this connected table, this connected X, Y, Z, and, and quite often they would just really pitch a product and it was like, it's great, we all, we all, I mean, I love products, I'm passionate about them, I backed a lot of products on Kickstarter, uh, but as an investor, I'm trying to, I'm looking for businesses, things that can grow in, and there's gonna be a whole generation of products, there's gonna be several products that might be moving away from the original product, that might be moving away from hardware, um, that might be building a hardware-enabled platform and then getting rid of the hardware because we don't need it anymore. Um, and I think having this vision in mind that you're not, what you're doing is a solution, a service, a platform, and that hardware is just going to be a way for you to get your customer more captive, uh, to, to, to create that um, toy and horse that we see in, in maybe 20 or 30 percent of the pitches that we receive, that is going to enable you to put a, a foot on the door and just get in, in there and just really kind of create something that's going to be sticky afterwards. 
um, and also getting out of this product cycle trap, life cycle trap that we discussed, which is like Sphero, great example. You do a partnership with, uh, with, uh, with Disney, works really well. You sell, let's say, $100 million of BB-8 two, or three, two, you know, two years ago. Then what happens the year after, right? Is there a new Star Wars movie? No, probably not. So you're trying to do, you know, an attachment to that product, an add-on or another product or different version of that, but you're not going to sell as much. And so you're going to have this peak of sales and then what happens the year after? It's going to be really hard to build a business that's like, you know, uh, having numbers that are consistent and growing years after years. Um, so obviously having this vision of creating a solution, a service and pl or a platform, um, and, and just seeing yourself more, more as a hardware-enabled uh, company than just a pure hardware product. We are doing one product, we're going to do another one, etc. Uh, is, is a good way to see that. And we don't see that in many, many pitches. Uh, so it all comes to bring the vision you have, trying to understand who your customer is, what is their problem, what, and how you can create a solution using hardware that is going to enable you to, carry, to own a, a space in general. And that might mean moving away from hardware moving forward. Uh, no one cares in the end. I mean, we're not, and we are hardware investors, and if a guy tells me, oh, you know, I'm doing hardware now, but like two years from now I might stop, I'm like, okay, you know, like uh, if that's what the customers want, if that's what uh, the solution, you know, that customers want, you know, brings you to, then, then okay, that's not a problem. Um, but we're in the business, or at least on our side, investing in companies in b building great and big businesses, not necessarily just, you know, uh, hardware data less. So I think that's one thing that is uh, uh, good to keep in mind. And last thing I want to say is that obviously I said a, a few things about Hardware Club, uh, and I said also that we're also uh, trying to, um, we have invested in companies in Germany, we'd like to at some point. Um, if you know, if you're a hardware founder, if you, if you think you need support, if you know other hardware founders that might need support, don't hesitate to refer them to us. Uh, the easiest way to apply is to go on the website and actually apply. It doesn't sound so obvious because many VCs don't, don't look at what comes on the website. We actually do. Um, and we have a full process that, uh, that, that goes through that. So even if we meet, we usually require companies to go on the website and apply. Uh, so don't hesitate to do that. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions. And thanks for hearing my very long uh, <laughs> Hey, uh, my name is Hervoy. I would like to get more information about when What's you... What's your name? I, di I didn't get your name. Hervoy. I'm from Croatia. Um, so the question is, uh, when you talk about launching small, uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? What would be the outcomes and what would be in the next steps after launching small? It's a good question. I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think the, the, what I mean by that, uh, the why should you launch small is because you want to focus on what matters first, which is user data and product market fit. What is the a large enough sample for you to get that data? I think that's kind of how much products you need to build first, and that could be prototype, that could be 3D printed, that could be done, you know, in a very cheap way without having to industrialize all this. Et At some point, you're going to have to go there, but like first, being able to create that set of data in terms of fundraising is going to be helpful. I'd rather have companies tell me, you know, we haven't taken another, but we have shipped. 50 products to 50 people that we know, and here's the data. Then someone telling me I haven't shipped one product, and you know I have this giant pre-order list of like 2,000 people waiting for the product, and that that amounts to like five million dollars. I've seen probably three or four or five or six companies with like five or more million dollars in pre-orders just collapse before they were able to ship one product just because they would go and meet VCs and uh, they would have the exact same reaction like, you know, but, so you want us to fund this, but you know, who, and there's this big risk as well that you don't ship in the end, that just, we just waste money, we don't know you. Um, you're like in the middle of cooking a product or cooking, you know, you're in your kitchen, you're trying to cook uh, food for your friends and you're coming and saying, hey, who has a bit of money for me to, to help me finish the, the you know, food? Everyone's like, we want to try the food and then maybe we'll give you more money, you know? Um, so the, the second part of your question was, what do you do with that afterwards? So all this obviously was really meant to fundraising, right? So it's really being able to raise money on top of that and then defining very clearly what are the next steps, what's the next milestone you can reach. 
uh, it's very different whether you're a consumer product or, or so I don't know about you guys. What, what are you, are you, are you building something or are you? Yeah, niche power banks. So yeah, depending on, I think once you're able to use that to fund your company, then you would define with the VC as well what are the next steps. Usually I would say it's, you're gonna have to start the industrialization process. So start making this something which you're gonna be able to make a million unit out of, um, but even in that process, you could, you could, you, there are steps you could take to actually make 2,000 products, 2,000 products first, and then, and then, and then move faster. Well, I, I think one thing, what I mean by is by this is I think there's, a, and that's one of the biggest difference between software companies and hardware companies. I think there's some, at some point, you want to move slow. What I mean by that is that you want to make sure you do the right things and you understand your market before you you go and spend that $500,000 or $1 million to industrialize those big NREs you're gonna to pay to a CM in China or, or somewhere else. Uh, I've seen too many companies try to spend that money and trying to raise money for that without having done the very first step of trying to get data on the initial product they had. To Thank you. at the end, but yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for the Thank you.